Well, I'm so lucky to be joined today by Rahul Sanad. He's the CEO and co-founder of TestLoop. That is the company I think that most of our viewers would know you from. You're also the founder of another company. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Is it Karmic? Yeah, that's actually not a company, but it's the um, product that we're releasing uh, to manage uh, vehicle connectivity for anybody with a Tesla. Yeah, but we call it okay. Karmic. So I want to get into that with you in a few minutes. But uh, first, I want to talk about uh, TestLoop because I think many of our viewers have at least heard of this. Um, this is a, uh, a car taxi service that uses only Teslas between, I think I'm getting this right, between LA and Las Vegas, or have you expanded? Yeah, so uh, we started um, kind of under the premise that Teslas are these amazing kind of new breed of transportation platform. And we figured the best use of a car would be long distance, just keep it running. So we have, um, in the context of that, um, we started with Vegas and then expanded that to San Diego and Palm Springs. And we were oh, wow. it, kind of the setup there was like an Uber pool or, you know, Southwest Airlines in a car. And we traveled about two and a half million miles in eight cars with over 25,000 customers. And then, um, you know, in the context of doing that, built a lot of software for talking to the cars, for using that for operations, for example, um, making sure that we could get the tires serviced properly, sharing information with insurance companies and such. So they could see that the cars were never going more than, you know, 80 miles an hour, which we speed limited. We really, I think, through Test Loop, discovered uh, the benefits of connectivity with regards to really running a fleet. And um, uh, in October, we made a decision that we would refocus the business instead of on uh, managing our own uh, cars that we have, rather on building software that would kind of take what we learned managing our own cars, but offer it to um, any Tesla owner. So now, when you talk about renting out the car, you're talking pre-autonomy. That you, we don't have to have robo taxis yet for this to work. Yeah, exactly. And and you know maybe I would uh, make a little bit of an analogy here to um, Zillow versus Airbnb. So on Zillow, you can sell your house, you can rent it out monthly. Um, somebody might rent it out monthly, but then they might put it on Airbnb and you know kind of tonight and one room and here and there, rent pieces of it out. But the fundamental idea of you have this uh, asset that can generate some amount of income, and now we think maybe that's you know, $500 to $1,000 for a Tesla, maybe more in some cases. Um, you know, once we're in a robo-taxi world, that could be you know, 3000 4000 maybe even much higher. Again, we were doing $17,000 revenue per month per car in Model Xs. So we know that's absolutely wow. possible in a Model X. And I would wow. argue you could do probably about 25,000 a month, um, you know, top line revenue, not profit. But uh, right, yeah, right. But, but that idea of kind of the high level rental of your vehicle, certainly before it's a robo taxi, but potentially even afterwards, that would be something interesting. So if you own a Model 3 and you're like, hey, I just want a bunch of money, so I'm gonna rent this to you for a year. You can figure out the robo taxi, how much you wanna use it, how much you wanna put it on the Tesla network, but give me $30,000, you know? So that's um, uh, effectively, uh, we think the key um, kind of economic benefit uh, today, and we think that extends into the future. But now, if I want to rent my car today, why not just put it on, let's say, Turo? Like, what, what would I need Karmic for? Yeah. So I think um, there's kind of two separate things going on. Firstly, when you put your car on Turo, I would liken it, you know, to getting a side hustle. Like it's kind of an alternate to Uber. You've got a job. It's not, you're not driving around, but you're doing customer service. You're cleaning the car. You're doing damage inspection, all of that. And um, we really feel that on top of um, Tesla's and the connectivity, you can make that effortless. So instead of kind of getting a job renting your car out, rather um, effectively you're renting your car onto our network and then we're taking care of everything. So we think most Tesla owners aren't looking for a second job, but they do have this incredibly valuable asset that can be efficiently um, you know, shared with other people, resulting in higher utilization and income uh, that's interesting. So I would say, uh, the first difference is taking the work out of it. 
And and it's interesting, even um, like figuring out when you should rent your car, uh, if um, somebody has the data feed to the car, they can see when it's being used, when it's not being used, and I can you know, notice that, oh, you parked at LAX in, the, in you know, a $30 a day parking area, and you did that for a week, um, you know, maybe you should rent your car out instead during that time. Click here if you want to do that next time you're on LAX. So that type of, uh, I think, intelligence you can build on top of the data feed that, um, you know, in a non-Tesla, that's just not really an option. I mean, we talk a lot on our show about the opportunities that are, are here and are coming. And it sounds like uh, on your platform, there's a huge opportunity right there. If I'm a viewer watching right now and I'm like, I could get into the business of buying used Teslas and putting them on this network and renting them out and basically taking what would have been a um, kind of end of life for most people. They think, OK, the car is, you know, three or four years old. It's time to start thinking about a new car. You're saying it's still a very valuable asset. Yeah. Um I mean, the reality is, I think every Tesla, barring any strange problems, is going to last more than half a million miles. And so you're going to have a very long life on that car. Um, and while it's not going to be as good as a new Tesla, it's going to be better than most cars on the road there. Um, so, you know, you're already seeing people buy a few Teslas and put them on Turo. But again, that is a, to me, a job decision, not a kind of investment decision. And we think we can move the needle towards more um, uh, kind of an investor attitude, including managing things like tax deductions, which can be very favorable for you uh, because you can deduct the 58 cents a mile. So, um, you know, we feel like just a, a Tesla centric approach or rather uh, you know, this, I'd say today it's Tesla centric, but really the idea of a connected EV centric approach is, um, you know, what we're focused on. And we think that ends up looking very different than something like Turo, which is optimized for three or four day rentals and for people to make a little bit of extra income from, you know, gas cars that are uh, kind of, you know, not serving them. That's cool. Now, when, when we do give people test rides and they've never been in an electric car and we tell them about, for instance, the the reduced braking or the fact that there's no exhaust system. I mean, you guys have experienced all that, right? So, I mean, tell me about, do you, do you really see these numbers? Like you've been talking about the fact, I think I saw this correctly, that you've gone something like 200,000 miles without changing the brake pads on one of your cars. Yeah, my guess is it's on all of the cars. I don't, I don't think we've ever uh, replaced brakes before that. I, I, I believe uh, the first car we did it at like 220K miles. And, and now again, I think, you know, Tesla's contention is on both batteries and brakes, they're going to make them last a million miles. So uh, I, I, I think that's incredible. You know, you know the, 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 the one interesting thing um, related to modeling the income potential of a car is I think what people are overlooking is long distance potential. Like typically Ubers, you're not taking like an Uber to go from LA to Vegas or something because it's too expensive because of the driver and the depreciation of your car becomes very significant. But the, mm -hmm. the key, I would say, um, core uh, factor that makes us think you can do much more revenue is that if you're going long distance, your um, cost per mile becomes much more important. I want to talk about Autonomy Day because about a week before Autonomy Day even happened, you had a video that came out and uh, Everything you talked about happens on Autonomy Day. It's like you were like somehow neuralinked into Elon's brain or something. How did how do you uh, you have a really good sense? I feel of what's what's happening in this space. Um, so tell me, how did you kind of know what was going to be talked about in Autonomy Day? Oh well, it, I mean, it, it Elon's been trying to make this argument well before Autonomy Day in a very non structured manner, but he basically did it on the you know, ARK Invest and then with Lex. And then I, I think there was a couple other places that he was talking about this all. And oh, and then he very much did it like, I, f I forget which earnings call, but like three earnings call ago, he had, um, you know, Andre and um, Pete Bannon talk about what they were doing. And it, it, I, I don't know, I just, at, at this point, you, you know, we, we've been doing this for three and a half years, but I was like a, 
a Tesla fanatic like since 2013 and, and basically consume all, you know, Tesla media, though recently it's kind of gotten a little harder to do that. But, um, you know, it, it was just, it was clear the argument that they wanted to make. And it was also clear to me that there was no new information, like the market was not going to react. Like, I feel like, um, like as like Kathy from ARC stated, like Elon really thought that this would, you know, change the, you know, Wall Street's perception of the stock price and whatever. But the fact is there was no new, uh, fundamental new info. I think the depth of the info really blew me away. Like, um, you, you know, so I was, like I bought stock after that, but I think nobody else did. Um, and, and, <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, you know, so I, I was confident like stock wouldn't move, but the other, I, I think, um, you, know, you know, really big reality is that I, I would say in general, as evidenced by voting with your pocketbook, nobody really believes Robo taxis will be somewhere working next year, as, as contended by um, Elon. Because if they did, the first thing you would do is you would run out and buy a Model Three with no down payment, and then probably call us up and say, "Hey, can I rent this out to cover my monthly?" Which you can totally do. Um, right. And then you would wait two years, and now your zero investment becomes worth two hundred thousand uh, dollars. You know, if you believe Elon's NPV numbers, and if you believe ours, probably more. Um, and uh, you know that would be, you know, uh, an, like a hundred x return on your money or something. Like it'd be much better than buying any stock or anything. Well, well, let me ask you about that because you know. So I agree with you that if you really are tuned in, you probably already saw all these puzzle pieces floating around, um, and he just kind of put them together on Autonomy Day. But um, and I agree with you, the stock didn't move. In fact, it went the opposite direction. Um, I felt like that had something to do with the fact that they were um, going to be doing a, a bond and a stock issue and the big banks were setting low price targets so they could get down in the action. But but regardless, you're right. It doesn't seem like most people believe Elon, at least his time frame. Um, do you believe his time frame? Like I'm an optimist like he is, so I want to believe. Um, I believe his time frame for the advancement of autonomy. I think the regulatory stuff is not in their control, so it's a little harder to say. But if it's like, you know, we'll have this working somewhere, if that means like, you know, Waymo and Phoenix or something like that, they get, you know, a city in Florida or, you know, Abu Dhabi or someplace in China, like, I believe you can cut that deal to let somebody basically pilot the cars, um, you know, in a robo taxi mode. Do, do you think Tesla will go for that? So you think that, you know, a year from now, uh, if they're having trouble making this, you know, obviously, I think you're right. I think, regu you know, regulatory bodies throughout the world aren't going to just jump on it. But I agree, there's probably certain states or cities that would. You think Tesla would reach out to those friendly cities and say, hey, let's turn on the network in your city? Yeah. Um, all, all they need to do is do what Waymo is doing in Phoenix with 100 cars or whatever. And I, I feel like they get 80% of the value at that point you know the cars can generate income in the future. You're not worried about the fundamental technological capabilities. It's just a question of when, where, how much. You could choose to send your car to that city in Florida to make money or whatever. Um, and uh, people will choose to buy those cars for themselves because of that future potential and everything. So, you know, I, I think they'll pull the regulatory part off somewhere. It doesn't matter where, like in some limited fashion. So really the question is, uh, are they 10x safer than a human driver? And and is that enough? Like, is it 5x or 10x or 20x? You know, what's the threshold that they're comfortable with um, that you would need to do? And I think the, uh, maybe the, they kind of talked about this, I was confused on it, but maybe the first service starts where you get in the driver's seat and you could take that over which means you'll have to be kind of vetted as a licensed driver and what have you. But um, there, there's two, like it's really weird to me that there's so many people on forums and everything saying, there's no way you can do that or whatever. And, and my kind of thought process is, well, you know, what information do you have versus what information do they have at Tesla? And it feels like, wow, they have a lot of information at Tesla. They, 
yeah. have all the data. They're <laughs> looking at people. They've done 9 million lane changes. They're in shadow mode. You know, they fundamentally understand AI better than 99.9% .9 of everybody commenting. And I would contend maybe <laughs> better than a large majority of people even in the space. Like, you right. know, for example, I was listening to a guy from Audi yesterday talk about their machine learning stuff for autonomy. And it was just not, um, you know, it felt like a college project, not a, um, exactly. you know, uh, like cohesive thesis for how something's happening. Right. And, you know, and I think on the counter side, Elon's chronically like, like compulsively optimistic. I, I mean, that's the downside. But, but again, the, I, I think the fundamental question here is, is the trend line um, exponential? You know, is, is it like, you know, Google's Go or, you know, StarCraft playing with AI? Like, it's just really going to follow that curve. And, and I think that's, that's where the divide is. Like, everybody's like, no, it's going to advance in a linear fashion. And they're saying, nope, that's not how it works. So that that's, um, you know, remains to be seen. But again, that means if they're late, three months does, you know, it's three months, but it's still six months later, much better than you believe. Right. So do you think one of the reasons why so many analysts and, uh, you know, Wall Street people have trouble believing Elon is because they look at all the competition and they see that the competition is using a completely different model of how to do it. And they think to themselves, well, if Google and Cruz and, you know, all these other companies are doing it with LiDAR and, and in small restricted um, pre-map spaces and you, Tesla, are doing it completely differently, that you must be wrong because you're going against the, you know, the, the bigger way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a, a cycle where you, you know, and you could tell this happened like at autonomy day where somebody's like, well, we talked to somebody and they said they have a lot of simulation miles. So isn't that right? And, and, and if you're not like really into it, you don't, you know, know what really matters. And I, I would put myself in that category. I'm like a casual observer of autonomy technology, but I actually don't you know, either work in the space or really deeply technically understand it or anything. And I think most analysts are probably, you know, not much farther ahead than I am. But and so they talk to 10 companies. And, and then I think what's most important, and this is like pervasive, is that when you work at a big company and the company's livelihood is based on some technology, it could be I used to work at Microsoft. It was Windows, like the idea that Linux would beat Windows was obviously wrong. The idea that iPhone would sell for $500 was ridiculous. Like that those just were not like sensible um, views views to hold like in the, you know, early 2000s at Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you get this, you know, psychology, you know, people use Nokia and Blackberry as examples where you know, I was in the phone space and I'd go to conferences and be like, oh, isn't the iPhone cool? And they'd be like, no, you can do everything you there on the Nokia. You know, you can look up the Internet. You can do a Google thing here. I'll show you how to do it. Like nobody could do it. They could do it. But it, it's this like um, uh, psychological. It, it's like an economic psychological brainwashing. I think there's a fundamental um, uh, behavioral characteristic that we should name where if your livelihood depends on it and there's no easy way to switch boats, you're going to yes. stick with your thesis, even if it's wrong, until it's like yes. definitively proven wrong. Mm -hmm. And like it would be so easy for Tesla to say, we'll add LiDAR, you know, right. no problem. We'll shut you up and we'll just we'll add but, it. But right. they're like, like, you know, that's absolutely not their MO. I mean, I mean no. to, to me, this is... The, the closest analogy here was like hydrogen, like, you know, again, in 2012, 2013, Toyota's all about hydrogen. And, you know, on the, on the in earnings call, somebody's like, well, Toyota's investing all this in hydrogen. Can you explain that? And they're like, no, we're totally <laughs> <Nope>. confused. <laughs> it makes no sense at all. They will realize that at some point, like, it's just beyond belief. And, and, and to me, like, LiDAR is the new hydrogen. It, 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 it's, they've just definitively convinced themselves that that's wrong. Now, it doesn't, 
I don't, I don't think it means that there's no chance they're wrong, but in their minds, they're already there. And I think their track record right. of, um, uh, like their track record on meeting deadlines is horrible, but their track record on uh, picking the right technologies and making the right bets, both economic and technical, is nearly flawless with a very few exceptions, like battery swapping stations. I mean, I guess what surprises me is that you take an IPO like Lyft and they come out and, um, you know, everyone knows what the company does and we, we know they're a viable company, but they come out with a valuation now of like $25 billion, um, whereas Tesla's at, what, $42 billion, and yet each year, it seems, they add a new business on top of their business. So now all of a sudden we've just learned that they know how to make autonomous chips. And to me, that's like, oh my God, you just added kind of NVIDIA-style uh, company to your company value and yet the stock market has been basically just churning through this valuation for the past five years and really said no you're not any more valuable than you were five years ago and to me uh, I can't believe it's gone on this long without it busting out to the upside when do you think I mean I, I assume you're long on Tesla you said you bought more shares what when do you think this is gonna happen that we're gonna bust out of this range uh, I think it'll be Q1 earnings next, uh, sorry, sorry, Q4 earnings next year. So Q1, uh, Q1, when they talk about Q4 earnings, I, I think you'll start to get um, the benefits of really good, you know, autopilot. So I think that'll spike sales a little bit. They'll, that'll increase the um, uh, take rate of FSD software, which is super high margin, so that'll help profits. I think you'll get the FCA, uh, you know, credits, you know, that don't matter too much, but it'll hit the bottom line. Um, and most importantly, like the, the fundamental thing is when I can get in my friend's Model 3 that he just bought and the thing drives him to work without him having to intervene not like as a 100% guaranteed everywhere, but like when city autopilot works as well as kind of highway, you know, navigate on autopilot works today. Like I, I think that's when it's obvious that things are happening. Like, like and, and I, I think the kind of an extension of what you were saying, oh, now they have a chip, now they have this, like, they, they really, what um, strikes me about Tesla is if you look at every other company out there, um, unlike the 10 things you need for a modern transportation platform, I would argue uh, there's nobody else who is the leader in a single one, which is like software upgradability, you know, hardware chips, um, supercharging infrastructure, uh, electric drivetrains, battery production, battery chemistry, all of those, um, and there's probably a couple more that I'm forgetting, but all of those areas, like I would say Tesla's number one in. There's, there's, no, there's no area where any other company is beating them. You know, with the exception of you say, oh, Waymo's leading on autonomy because I think you could argue and say that in their limited areas, the no amount of driver interventions Waymo needs is way less than Tesla needs, except the areas are completely different. So I, I think on that one front, but but you would have to say that's not a scalable solution. So, I, I mean, if you believe Elon at all. So, uh, but but it's just going to be so hard for anybody else to catch up. And, and, and for me, the fundamental... Uh, like strategic advantage Tesla has is, so they're a leader in all these areas, it's all vertically integrated so they can coordinate everything perfectly. If they want, you know, the charge, the charger to coordinate with the AI net and everything, that's like, you know, a week's work for Elon to tell everybody to make that happen. Whereas at any other mm -hmm. company, it's like 12 companies and nobody, <laughs> literally nobody knows how things fit together. Um, right. And then, uh, you know, so it's this nimbleness of coordination of the full stack. The full stack's completely under their control. Now, when um, robo taxis actually start happening, let's say it's next year or the year after, whenever they start happening, how does that affect your business model? Um, is that one of the reasons why you're switching kind of from a taxi service to um, 
software service? I, I, I don't know if that's, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's the reason we're switching. I think the reason we're switching was fundamentally uh, the feeling that it, it would be better to add like 10 units of value to a million cars than add a thousand units of value to 10 cars, you know? So just the idea that there is opportunity to make everybody's Tesla ownership experience better to get more access to every Tesla car, that that is a more scalable business. Um, and and uh, I, I think in terms of our team, we're very much kind of software people. So it's a little bit more in the sweet spot of building software versus uh, you know, managing hiring people and things like that and labor law and all of that. Um, but I, I think robo taxis, you know, they're going to have two effects. They're going to um, uh, like the most interesting thing to me is if you have a million cars and today, well, let's say you have 500,000 cars that are worth $40,000 today. Um, in a year, you have a million cars but then they're worth $200,000 each, you're, create, you're basically creating $200 billion of value out of thin air. And right. you know, the last time we saw this was in crypto and that created a massive frenzy at every level to the point where crypto funding you know, overtook VC funding for a while and what have you. So, um, so there's going to be like this huge economic implication and I think that will radically impact the world outside of Tesla, because now every other car, you know, as Elon says, becomes a horse, but certainly depreciates faster. The depreciation models don't make sense. There's financial, like lender implications to that and everything. Uh, but for us, um, you know, I, I just feel like it's an unknown world. Like, I think it's incredibly difficult to predict what the world looks like when cars go off and make money for you. It's just kind of, there's no precedent to something like that. Like Airbnb is a little bit of a precedent, but it's kind of different. Um, but I mean, would you dip your toe in the water? So let's say in a year or two, there's robo taxis. Um, would you, since you already have a lot of experience with the fleet, would you consider getting a couple cars, putting them on the network and seeing what kind of money you can earn from it? Yeah, well we have, I mean, we have, a handful of cars that we'll certainly put on the network. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. So, so I think our our goal is going to be to work with owners and say, how do you optimize the value of your car, and is that putting it on the network and driving it the rest of the time, or is it renting a different car, maybe that has you know, are you willing to drive an autopilot one car to work every day and get paid? For your robo taxi, which can make car. more money, you know. So, so there's going to be all these weird kind of financial arbitrage questions when you sell your car. Now it's going to be a very different equation, you know, because you're going to be, well, I'm in California and they've launched this in Florida. How long will that take? Should I send it to Florida? There's going to be like a thousand economic decisions to make in a world of uh, asset producing cars, you know, revenue generating. And that's cars. where the and that's where the data comes in, right? So let, let's get to that for a second. So if there's people out there watching right now and they're like, this is intriguing, I want to learn more about Karmic. I noticed that you're offering like an introductory uh, way to get onto your network. Can you tell me about that? Basically, the, the way Karmic works is any um, owner can in like two minutes sign up. And what we will do is um, we will start querying your car we will start storing all your data. And our attitude is, we are doing this for you. This is your data. We are a software utility that helps you do that. So that's kind of proposition number one. Um, you know, the second proposition we came out with is we'll do a little bit of analytics on your battery usage and what have you uh, to maybe let you charge smarter. And what we see is that almost 15% of people and 30% of Model S owners charge to 100%. This is not, um, probably something they mean to be doing. And once you have the data feed, you can tell if it makes any sense. Because if they're driving like 250 miles the next day, you could argue like, okay, that's fine. You have a little bit of buffer, your battery will degrade, but it's worth it to not stress out. But if you're driving 50 miles the next day, it just means that you set that, you forgot it, you don't know what's going on. And we should just help you fix that, which we can do in an automated manner. The next proposition is to say, well, how much is your car worth? That's something interesting to know. 
And unless you're selling or renting your car, it's not that important. But once you, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, but once you want to sell it or rent it, that becomes really important. So then the next proposition is, um, you know, how long does it take to list your car for sale now on Craigslist or Auto Trader or somewhere? It's probably like 20 minutes. You got to figure out, you know, everything that's going on. So um, we think that can turn into one minute and you can probably push that to all of those places uh, seamlessly. And then like renting your car now on Turo is literally like probably many hours of work understanding the policies and what have you. So we think we can also streamline that. So that's kind of where we see the progression of, um, you know, the kind of karmic um, uh, engine going in terms of this is an engine that grabs all your data and, and uses it uh, with a goal of kind of benefiting you economically, like letting you use your car or plan for your car in, in a better manner. So we can say, hey, you know, we know that for every mile of degradation your Model S has, you lose... Um, $168 uh, dollars of value. Like that's kind of the um, current um, uh, correlation. So if instead of charging 200%, you charge to 90%, you'll save two miles of degradation or, you know, $320 this year. So those are the types of wow. things you can start doing. And I think in a robo taxi world, the stakes are higher. You know, now maybe you can rent your car out for on average, you'll get a few hundred dollars, but if it becomes several thousand dollars, like a 2% optimization of that in the future is much more important. I guess uh, just kind of a cool personal point here is that I do you know, my weekly show with, with Jesse, he's my son. You, you founded your company uh, with your son, Hayden. Uh, tell me like, what it's like to work with your son. Yeah, so like Hayden kind of came up with the idea as a ploy to get a car for the summer, and then he realized he might be able to leverage my Tesla enthusiasm to get me to lease him a car for the summer. But then, you know, it really evolved into a startup, and I've been doing startups prior to this. So, um, oh, so that's why he's the chief evangelist. Yeah, well, also that's just kind of his, I think, strength. <laughs> he's um, really good at talking about things and maybe simplifies things more than. I do, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a very relatable way. But, you know, Hayden was 16 when we started the company. He's 20 now. And, you know, I, I would contend that he can talk as knowledgeably about mobility as anybody, at, you know, Lyft or what have you. So, um, you know, I think it's been a great education, um, you, know, you know, for him. He's doing classes at college at the same time as he's doing uh, – uh, you know, full-time work at the company and, you know, he's getting really experienced at YouTube and, you know, so there's just, um, I, I think it's been really, uh, you know, interesting to watch, you know, a high schooler turn into a kind of, you know, startup, um, you know, multifaceted startup generalist. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us. I think all the stuff we've been talking about today is fascinating, and I really think that you're underselling yourself. You, you, you kind of said at one point that you thought that you were just kind of a enthusiast here, but I really feel like you've grasped this better than most people do because the fact that you were able to take all those pieces that were kind of maybe floating around in what Elon had talked about for years and put them together so eloquently before Autonomy Day into basically exactly what he said uh, was quite astounding, and you're just, you're uh, understanding of what's going on to me is is quite profound. So I really appreciate your insight into what you think is, is happening. Well, yeah, thank you for that. And we hope we can leverage all of that into, you know, product that will help every Tesla owner out there. And I think you'll see, um, you know, over the next few months, like uh, the, the, you know, karmic product really developing into something that moves from kind of an interesting, nice to have to something that for a lot of people, um, you know, becomes, you know, an important part of their Tesla ownership experience.